coming up next. For those interested in getting into writing as a career or a hobby, what is one piece of advice that you can, can give them? Invest in yourself and go check out a conference. Find wherever you live. I promise you there's got to be something either in your city or close to you. Find a conference that looks interesting to you. Go check it out. Go to the forums, panels, all those kind of discussions. Go to the ones specifically with editors and publishers. Welcome to the Job Talk podcast, where we talk with people who love their jobs. Our guests open up about their challenges, surprises, and secrets to success in their industries. Through conversation, we explore their careers, past work experiences, and the education that got them to where they are now. Today's guest is Christina Quintero. Here's our job talk with an author and community builder. Christina, I think we should start with, can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and we'll talk about how you you got into writing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, I've been a reader my entire life. So when you are a reader, I think reading is breathing in, writing is, you know, breathing out. Um, and so I actually, I, I, so two things. One, um, I do write across a lot of genres. So I'm working on a cookbook. I do celebrity ghost writing. Um, I have a picture book coming out with Penguin Tandra in October of this year, which is very exciting. Um, and there may or may not be a sequel coming. Uh, and uh, also, I've been working on some TV scripts, which is kind of fun, developing some TV show ideas for uh, kids. And yeah, in my, my day-to-day life, I do have a nine-to-five job. Writing doesn't fully cover the bills at this point, but hopefully it will not too long in the future. Celebrity ghostwriting, what, what is that all about? I'm, I'm really interested <laughs> in that. Yeah, I know. Everyone always is. They're like, I'm with it. And could I guess, can I have a clue? Uh, so no to all of those things you might be able to get, but I wouldn't tell you if you did. Uh, celebrity ghostwriting, basically my agent pair me with, um, say there is a super famous person who, uh, in whatever field they are in, um, has an idea for a book and they need someone to write it because they themselves are not the writer, but they have an idea they have a story they want to tell. And so someone like me get paid to write it for them and then when it comes out it just says their name on the cover uh and not mine and i get paid okay so you're based in edmonton alberta canada sherwood um, park actually sherwood park yeah yes, sherwood park sorry no, no uh, bedroom okay. bedroom community to edmonton uh for absolutely listeners that don't know how, how do people find you you mentioned you have an agent could you talk about the process of finding an agent and working yeah with yeah, see, it's really cool. The whole process was pretty wild. So this, uh, my the book coming out in October, um, isn't the first book I've written. The first book I wrote was actually uh, when I went through breast cancer, just about a decade ago now. Um, and going through breast cancer as a woman of color in a really small community, the resources were just literally not there. So some of the things, um, you know, just a lot of the rehabilitation programs post mastectomy camisoles and I, you know, come in skin tones, kind of like how Crayola ended up having to do a rebrand on, you know, now slush tone is called peach, those kind of things. Um, anyways, so it was more of a like, Hey, here are some things that this industry hasn't really considered. Um, and I do say industry when I talk about breast cancer, because a lot of it feels like that. Honestly, it feels like a bit of a machine. Um, so anyhow, what, when I going through it, what I recognized was, part of the reason that a lot of this knowledge is lost is that you're so just happy to be done going through cancer that you kind of don't want to keep talking about it in many ways. Right. So, um, I kind of wrote a bit of a girlfriend's guide to going through breast cancer. And so what I did was I interviewed all the different people I knew that had been affected by it. So I interviewed, interviewed men, women, children, um, children of survivors, children of deceased, uh, breast cancer, um, you know, I guess victims, I'm not sure what the word I want to use there, but either way. Uh, so I ended up kind of collating it into this, a series of questions, kind of like an interview kind of ended up forming a pain or we're generally speaking, these are the things people want to talk about. So when I talk to you about going through breast cancer and reconstruction, 
I can tell you about my friend Kim who had this type, or I can tell you about um, Olga whose uh, diagnosis was really tricky because her her uh, lump was non-globular. But what she found was that she like she ex- explained it as a, a tortilla. She said it felt like a little tortilla, her lump, which is so interesting because at, she herself is from Spain. So um, that was her reference on it, right? So we all have this, like the way that you, your background feeds into these things and how you then describe those things to a medical professional, they can be different. So all that to say, uh, I wrote that, I went to a writer's conference out in Surrey, the Surrey International Writers' Conference. And even that, I heard about talking to a bookstore owner in Canmore who had herself written a couple of kids' books. And so she's like, oh, you should go to Surrey. That's where I, I pitched my book. And I was like, well, I'm going to guess I'm going to Surrey. So I went to Surrey to the International Writers' Conference. Uh, I had my manuscript that had a blue pencil uh, by Susanna Kearsley, who's a Canadian author, who if you're into kind of historical um, fiction, like if you like Diana Gabaldon, for example, you would love Susanna Kearsley. So anyways, I got to actually take a class from Diana Gabaldon at that. She's the one who wrote uh, out loud for that entire series. And it was, I, uh, I met some cool people, kind of just stayed in touch. Then it's a pandemic. I'm sitting at home as all, you know, as are we all. And uh, we're all making bread because it's what we do. <laughs> and I had this thought and I'd, I've long had this, this belief um, that everyone, you'll notice I have like a little pierogi necklace, a little gold pierogi. Uh, and it's a, a bit of a Rorschach because people were like, is that a, I'm like, well, what do you think it is? Like, is it a gyoza? And I'm like, yeah, it is if you want it to be. Is it an empanada? Yeah, it is if you want it to be. Everyone's got a dumpling, right? And everyone has a bread. So um, I ended up finding this contest online for this book festival called the Festival of Literary Diversity. It's called The Fold. And I had actually met J.L. Richardson, the executive director at Surrey a few years ago. And so on Twitter, I had seen that she put, put this thing up for a kid pitched a kid's book pitch. So I sat down five hours later, I stood up with like a rough copy and I hit send because I thought, well, why not? I don't know. There's nothing else to do. I guess I could go do a tour of my house again. <laughs> Maybe I'll be adventurous. I'll go to my front yard instead of my backyard. So touring, touring my house, you know, uh, and then, um, I got a call actually somewhere in there. My grandmother had actually passed. So I actually missed the series of email requesting, like, did, did you want to do this? Like, Hey, yes. We're saying yes. Uh, do you want to do this? Like, luckily Ardo, who is, um, I don't know, the head fairy godmother over there, basically double checked. And she's like, Hey, just before I pass this opportunity on to someone else, are you sure you want to pass? And I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. In my grandmother's passing, I just missed this. So they squeezed me and turns out they paired me with the editor from Penguin, which luckily I didn't realize it was Penguin because I think I might have lost my pool just a little bit, you know, had I realized that that's what I was, that's who I was going to be speaking with. Um, and uh, anyway, so we we meet by Zoom, uh, can't get into the Zoom room. So I'm like emailing like crazy, just going like, hey, I'm here, please let me in. So finally I get into the Zoom room, we connect, she's like, oh, I was eating a dumpling the other day. And I had this thought that you, everyone has a dumpling. And I said, funny, you should mention that. <laughs> so it was just like kismet, right? Like it just moment, like what, all these lovely uh, confluences that just kept happening. So a couple weeks later, I get an email. It's November 10th, 2020. Uh, and I get an email from Penguin Random House saying that we would like to offer you a one or book deal. Um, and wow. <laughs> yeah. So was was this your first attempt at writing a book? No, because my breast cancer book is actually fully written. Uh, yes. So I will say no, but yeah, this was like my first. Like I, I'm a little bit of a unicorn in this one. Like that needs to be acknowledged. This is yeah. not the typical path. Um, right. And I also would love to acknowledge that I work in a five job, and I think that's really key for artists to remember. Yeah. Is if you are spending all your time trying to figure out how you're going to pay your bills, your art is never going to flow. So I am deeply grateful that I have a job that 
I can just go to. I do it. It's great. Um, and then I can come home and be interested in doing art and engaging in, in the parts of me that are, you know, a little more dynamic. So anyways, um, through that whole process, I'm staying in touch on Twitter through a couple of friends that I met at Surrey Writers Conference. And um, so I get this book deal offer for one book, actually, is what it was. And um, then I, I I messaged my friend, like, hey, Robin, <laughs> uh, I have this book deal, and I'm just not sure if I should get a lawyer to look at it. And so she said, well, uh, you can, but wouldn't you rather have an agent? And I said, well, yeah, but how am I going to get an agent? And she said, Christina, you have a book deal from Penguin in your hand. You can have an agent. So she connected me, actually, with another writer whose agent was looking to in sort of um, increase their load, uh, their, their roster. And after meeting with them, uh, it turned out just because I do write across the spectrum. Like, again, I'm writing a couple of cookbooks right now. I'm working on a historical um kind of biography of our family because I have a really interesting family background I'll tell you more about that after but um yeah anyways so long story short I ended up connecting with these agents who were just sort of new to my agency which is transatlantic which is actually a phenomenal phenomenal huge agency uh that actually just expanded into television so like I but, but the doors just open and open and open and open and open and uh, I, I, I feel gratitude in my very narrow, honestly, for the people who have been so kind as to not just open doors, but to take them off the pins as they walk through themselves, right? Yeah. And then to be like, hey, over here, <laughs> you got to come yeah. this way, right? And to make those connections because this business is nothing if not connections. There are so many gifted writers out there. There are so many artists who haven't found that, that home for their art or their voice yet. Um, and I think a lot of it is just get to know people, be kind, be interested, be sincere, you know, yeah. um, you don't have to buy every writer's books that you talk to go to the library, especially if they're Canadian, because Canadian authors, if they're registered with the writers union of Canada, which most of us, there's no good reason not to be, uh, yeah. we get paid every time you take it out of the library. So oh, if people wow. who, yeah, absolutely. You get royalties. So people who think. Um, oh, well, yeah, I can't really buy that book. Oh my gosh, you don't have to. Please don't. <laughs> you don't yeah. go to the library, request it. Every library should have a copy. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Th thank you for sharing uh, your story about breast cancer. My wife just went through that as well. I'm sorry I that heard. you went through that. Um, and I'm glad you made it through okay. And that obviously such a life-changing moment. It's you know. Obviously, it in it inspired you to write that book and get into that. Oh, would, I think it, yeah. I mean, I think I'm not. I'm never going to be that person who's like, oh, breast cancer made me a better person. You know what? I was pretty fun, honestly. I wasn't a serial killer. I was good. I didn't need that level of self improvement. Thank you so much for people whose well intentioned words, uh, yeah. you know, speak to that. Uh, really, I yeah, I was just a super unlucky woman. And actually, yeah. I mean, your wife is a similar age demographic. I remember Joel told me and, um, you know, it, it sucks. There's no nice, it's terrible. I had to choose between life and limb. I had to walk in one day to a hospital knowing that when I left, I was leaving body parts behind. Mm -hmm. It was awful. It was a terrible, no good, very, very bad day, yeah. you know? And, um, I am glad that your wife is also, I know I asked, I asked Joel for an update. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, for sure. You know, but it's tough, right? Because it's, it's not linear. It's not, your body is forever changed. You are forever changed. You have a sense of time in a different way. So I think what breast cancer did was just maybe reminded me a little bit that um, it might be slow, but the time's going to pass anyway. So just yeah. try, right? Just, just do the thing, just try it out, see what happens. Um, and in, in my case, I got really lucky and now I have, you know, I've got this to show for it, which is very exciting. And, and there, um, yeah, there, there will be more good news to come with regards to my published work. So, okay. So you're holding one of your books there. Yeah, uh, I am. It's called the us, only, yeah. 
the <laughs> only way to make bread. Please talk about it. Um, I would yeah, love let us know to. about this project. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to do a huge shout out to Tundra Penguin. So Tundra is a Canadian imprint, the kid, Canadian kids imprint for Penguin, Random House. And when they talk diversity, equity, and inclusion, I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. So you guys, can't, you won't be able to see this, but this is an embossed cover. This is money. When Penguin said that they care about stories about people of color and inclusion and equity and bringing it to the table, you embossed my cover. That matters. It meant it means that like you cared. They cared. They they said it and then they did it because plenty of places will say the thing, but show me the thing. Do the thing. Make a place workplace equitable, inclusive, diverse. Um, give me representation, please, because uh, I I just. I think we've made so many gains and advances as as a as a human race in terms of seeing each other for who we are and our value. Um, and it's okay to acknowledge that there's still room to go. It doesn't make anyone a bad person. It doesn't make you bad because you haven't considered that maybe your AI is your AI recruiting is set to uh, prefer resumes that have a four year degree versus say a two year. That doesn't make you a bad person, but have you considered that some parts of the world, that program may actually only be a two-year program, right? So you may be without even meaning to, right? And it's it's not a matter of hate. It's not a matter of necessarily even personal bias so much as just you haven't considered this thing. So those are all the conversations that are so hard to have because they're deep, they are rich, and they are complex and they are so personal. And a lot of those conversations feel a lot like finger pointing. They feel like this of like, oh, well, you did this bad thing. You said this thing. Um, and yeah, sometimes people say really crappy things. Like I had a guy come into my office today and he was referring to the ethnic on his block. And he thought, oh, yeah, I'm not going to win. I'm, I'm spending zero time on this conversation with you because. I have zero wins and I have zero skin in the game with you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, I came home and told my family everything. I was like, okay, if you ever run into this guy in town, go the other way, okay? <laughs> but um, the one thing that we do all have in common, and actually Ava DuVernay, the filmmaker, she talks about everyone is human at the table. And everyone is. And the, my book begins with, it's a story of making bread. And it says, um, the only way to make bread is like this. First, you need a table, well, or it can be a counter. Uh, and then you need a bowl, but it can be any color. Mine is blue, it's white on the inside, it's got kind of milky looking. Uh, then you're going to need flour. And so I talk to you about the different kinds of flour. And then I talk to you about um, the different kinds of ingredients that you might use in it. So you get to see in people's kitchen, and you get to see the way in which different ingredients are pulled in and different techniques are. Um, and then we talk about how you're going to cook them. And then we talk about the secret ingredient that we all have, of course, which is love. Because, you know, it is. You make food with love and people know, like, every parent knows what it is to eat a really terrible Mother's Day breakfast or Father's Day lunch, you know? <laughs> but your kid has made it for you, so you're going to eat it, even if it pickles with, you know, pancake syrup with some very, very burnt toast. Like, you're going to eat yeah. it and say, thank you. You're going to love it. <laughs> um, and then it ends with a community gathering and sharing all of their types of bread. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Um <laughs> And it really it ends with saying the only way to make bread is your way. And throughout the entire book, what you do see is families from different parts of the world all living together in the same community, making bread in their way, and then coming to the table to share it. Because and, to me, yeah, go, go on. Oh, sorry, I interrupted you, but well, um, you had beautiful artwork. Who, who did the yeah, artwork? Yeah, Sarah on, Gonzalez. On... She's a Filipina. Uh, illustrator. She lives in Montreal, but she was actually raised in Dubai, I believe. What I always forget. Saudi Arabia, sorry. Uh, yeah, so she was raised in Saudi Arabia, now lives in Montreal. So uh, fantastically vibrant artist. Her Instagram is Sarah Gonzalez. Uh, S-A-R-A-H 
G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-S. I'll send you some links after too. Um, but anyways, her work, she has published work in the Atlantic. She's been in all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, like all over the place. It's remarkable. I can't believe that my editor saw her work and then just made that connection of how perfect it would be. And yeah, it is. she's just a lovely human. So I'm very, very fortunate to have worked with her. Uh, and yeah, her art, absolutely insanely gorgeous. It's, it's, it's really something else to, to look into a book and to see. Um, I mean, in my case, I get to look into the book and see myself, quite literally, <laughs> um, and my kids, right? But also for families to see themselves and to see themselves, one of the last things that, like, and again, this is where, you know, you say something and you do something is they included even a couple of pages for recipe. So there's my recipe for bread, which is a Colombian flatbread called arepa. And then there's pan de sal, which is a Filipino bread. And then the cool thing that they did, um, even in terms of our, just before those two pages, is two pages of other types of bread. So including bread from all over the world and including Canada. Uh, as part of that, to say, you know, like my best friend, Carol, she makes the world's best dinner buns. And if anyone wants to prove me wrong, I will give you my address. So you can send them to me and I'll sample them and I'll tell you. I'll tell you if you make them better. But um, yeah, it's it's phenomenal. Just we have this thing in common, right? We all, everyone's got to eat. And the word companion literally means the person with whom you break bread. And I think the, the heart of that language is to say that when you've broken bread with someone, you now share a path, right? It is so much harder for me to now dislike you or to want to disagree with you or to want to just agree to disagree and walk away. When we've sat and we've shared a conversation, we've had a meal together, I know you, you know, uh, even just a tiny bit and you know me a tiny bit and it opens the floodgates of compassion and empathy to see each other and to understand how when I tell you that as a woman of color going through breast cancer, it was very disheartening to already be going through it and then to realize that here is one more way in which this wasn't set up to help me get better, right? And it's something as simple as your post mastectomy camisoles not being the skin tones, you know, that fall within. And, and I'm not a particularly dark skinned Latina, you know, I'm, I'm much lighter than my siblings even. So um, it, it's those, that level of thoughtfulness that when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, I think people start to tune out because they think, oh my God, I had to do that workshop, check mark, got the certificate, hi done, we're good. But the truth is that, that when we talk about those things, this is this um, infographic many of us have probably seen about uh, um, equity and equality. And you see a group of kids, like say at a fence, or you see a group of people at a fence and they're trying to see over the fence. And you see that people are different heights or have different abilities. And so if you give everyone the same box, that's equality. But if you give everyone the size box that they need to see over the fence, that's equity. And that is a conversation. It's not saying that people are looking for more. It's saying that we're looking for equal access to the same opportunity. And so when you even build the world, if you're thinking about building a physical building, start from the curb, make sure it's a banked curb because you are going to anyone with wheels or any sort of mobility issues. So whether that's someone in a wheelchair, a walker, person with a stroller, a bicycle, rollerblade, skateboard, you have now opened that space up to be accepting and open to everyone to approach it with safety, right? And so then everyone gets to feel that a little bit better. People feel better. They behave better. People are less cranky. People feel understood. They want to understand you though. They're just that little bit extra patient when you give that bit of extra patience. And this book for me was a way of being able to call people to the table to say, Hey, Maybe you need a table, but maybe I need a counter. It's cool because at the end of the day, we all get our bread out of the deal, right? And hey, you let me try yours. I could some of mine. Try it. What ages was that book written for? 
So let me just see. I, it's so funny. I'm like, I can't remember what we actually ended up following with, but it, this is a great, this is probably a really good book. Um, early years. So probably like middle, like elementary um, and preschool is probably really good. But one thing I would tell you as a, a former family liter literacy coordinator and, and educator is every book is a children's book. If you just read the pictures, you know, that's the beauty of a picture book is that you read the pictures, you ask kids to show you, hey, can you show me something red? Can you show me something blue? Can you find the dog? Right? Um, is there a cat? I don't see a cat anywhere, but is there a bird? You know, oh, yes, there's a cat right there. Uh, so, you know, uh, yeah, ideally, ideally, yeah, the kids who are going to enjoy this most probably early elementary and preschool. Uh, but I think anyone who's really interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion and in making that and understanding maybe in a different way what that means, I think this is a book that could be used in an HR class, honestly. Yeah. I, I don't want to go too far off the topic of writing because no. that's, yeah. the, that's what the episode's that's about. Okay. But can you, can you touch on your family background? I'm from Columbia. I was born in Canada, but my parents arrived the year before I was born. So um, they hadn't quite realized that they left the country yet. You know, <laughs> so I was very much raised in uh, Colombia inside of Canada. It is that, you know, they, they weren't ready to let go. So Spanish is actually my first language. English is my second. And um, then uh, my dad descends from enslaved Africans, actually in Colombia. So Colombia was a major slave trade route. So my dad, uh, that's part of his heritage and obviously mine. And my mom descends from one of the indigenous peoples of Colombia called the Chibcha uh, or Moisca. And so the cool thing about this for me is there are people, even my last name, Quintero, isn't actually necessarily our last name. It's the name of the person, of the, the slave owner who owned my last, like my first freed relative, right? So in choosing to use that name, it is the one I most identify with in terms of my Latino heritage, but it isn't necessarily the name from which I derive the most strength. Um, so the one book that I am trying to, the family history I'm working on, is actually trying to find those stories and to trace back, even just to know which nation my my ancestors would have been stolen from, because they're like when you look through those slave registers, because that's what you have to do is you, you're going through these these manifests, and you'll see however many pounds of oranges, however many pounds of cinnamon, however many pounds of this, a dried fish, nine males this age roughly this many females uh pigs flour that's that's heavy work <laughs> it is extremely heavy work and i remember leaving my laptop for a moment and my son was nine at the time when i was doing starting this research uh and you know i left the room for a second and he came back and he typed in nine-year-old boys just to see like you know and there it was, there was like a series of nine-year-old boys that had been abducted, essentially stolen, um, and then sold, right? So that work gets very heavy. I'm very happy to take breaks from it and to focus on writing food stories sometimes and to do celebrity projects, which can be kind of fun and distracting from some of that heavier work whose stories are equally worthy in terms of telling that because also... You know, Colombia is a braid. There is a heavy, it, very similar. Colombia is actually so similar to Canada in many ways. Um, so like I said, my mom descends from the Chipcha. So my mom went to what is essentially residential school in Colombia as a child. So she had, I won't tell too many things because it's her story to tell, not mine. But she had many similar experiences that children in residential schools here had. Um, and so Colombia is this mix of colonial so like Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Italian blood, plus uh, indigenous peoples and inside African. So we're this really lovely, beautiful, uh, I think the movie Encanto was a little confusing to people because they're like, excuse me, that lady has curly red hair and green eyes and is super fair. 
But the truth is the phenotypes of Colombians are really broad because of that diverse history. Yeah. Are, are you going to write in Spanish, do you think? Or is it always English? I think I'll probably always write in English. My hope is, yeah. of course, uh, of course, I would hope that everything eventually would be translated into. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I'm also too far removed from living in Colombia for my entire life that I wouldn't be able to really truly write in the way that I can express myself in English. So Spanish may be my first language, but I would tell you, it may be my mother tongue, but it is more accurate to say that English really is my primary language. Yeah. Um, how do you handle, and this, I'm, I'm a video shooter and editor by trade, so I'll put my work up on YouTube and the general public will, will look at it. I'm curious to know how you handle constructive criticism or um, maybe... <laughs> bad reviews not saying that you've ever had one but well the good news is i haven't had a bad review yet because nothing's over yeah. <laughs> um but i pay my agents 15 percent to give me bad uh, to give me feedback so yes. if you want to get good at anything get good at receiving feedback because if i read the first iteration of this like my very first draft it was good it was solid it had legs you know it could go somewhere that said Sam Swenson, my agent at Penguin, uh, is an absolute goddess of editing and who was able to understand. And even just to say, hey, my tongue is getting tripped up here. Is there a different way that you could say this? Uh, or, you know, I'm wondering about this. You haven't talked about salt, actually. She's like, like if it's bread, shouldn't there be salt? And he said, well, you know what? Yeah, it's some bread you might. You're totally right. Let's toss salt in there. Uh, you know, so... I think that if you want to get good at anything, get really good at taking that feedback. Uh, as far as reading negative reviews, that's a choice. That is between you and your therapist if you choose to do that. I think I'm super not interested in uh, as long as my agents can keep selling my book um, and everything. So this book, again, I got the book offer on November 10th, 2020, and it hits the shelves October 3rd, 2023. That's almost three years traditional publishing yeah traditional traditional publishing is very slow very slow um and it's because it's this huge machine so that when this book comes out it's going to hit the country like i will never have to sit in front of a bookstore with a pile of books and try and convince people to buy them penguin just will have it in every bookstore across the country you know that's that is a huge advantage if you, if someone is considering um, telling a story, my friend Phil is a perfect example. So Phil has this beautiful organization called Amy's House. It is in honor of his late wife, Amy, who died of lung cancer at this startlingly, shockingly young age of 38. And she was an ultra marathoner, scrappy little thing. I think Amy was maybe what, all five feet in? You know, maybe five, two? Um, and built like an ultimate ultra marathoner. So the last thing they were looking for was lung cancer. She didn't have any of the lifestyle factors that might've been considered. So by the time they started looking at that, they were like, this is kind of crazy, but we're going to do this. We're going to just check just cause it's weird, but let's see. Well, sure enough, it was too late. It was stage four, not a static and it didn't take long. And she fought like an absolute beast. That woman was an absolute marvel of grace and kindness and strength and endurance and love, 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 love. And she left behind this massive legacy of love because she was that person. You know, I ever only got to meet Amy a handful of times, but my husband actually was roommate with um, her husband uh, when, when my husband and I first met. So, uh, you know, the way that she just created waves of love in this community. So they had a rental property that then after her passing, Phil actually started a nonprofit called Amy's House. Uh, they have this beautiful uh, event called Night of Artists. Please check it out. You'll be so happy you did. If you've got a bare wall or something that you bought at Ikea once upon a time, like do yourself a favor, go to the Night of Artists, buy some art. It's local and it supports Amy's House, which is essentially like a Ronald McDonald's house for adults 
outside of Edmonton who are coming into town for lung cancer treatments. And it is full. And actually, they just opened up Amy's house too, uh, which is remarkable and amazing. And it goes to show the kindness um, of a community, really like so just got out of the way of the kindness of the community and created this incredible, incredible place. Um, and Phil, he blogged every single day on Facebook and um, also Instagram, but I think primarily Facebook about he and Amy, their story. It's amazing. It is a love story that puts the notebook to shame truly because it is one of just intense love and commitment and their young family, their kids were so little when Amy passed. Um, and my kids were so, my kids were three and six when I was six. So I had a great compassion for their situation. And uh, anyways, for Phil, he was like, three years, I can't do it. I can't, I can't wait three years. So with the help of some friends, he got the book edited and uh, then put it out. And it's called Run On Amy. And it's available at uh, his Bonnie Doon shop location of Night of Artists Gallery. So he was a person who couldn't wait for traditional publishing to tell the story, at, right? And or should he? Because in the meantime, what people need to understand is that lung cancer isn't just for smokers, right? So if he waited three years, for him, he understood the urgency of, I have to tell people the story. I have to tell people because what if someone else is in a similar circumstance and doesn't pursue testing and doesn't know what to ask and all of those things. And, you know, you and I having now walked this cancer road, either as supporters or as survivors um, or graduates, as I call myself, uh, you know, you know, the matter of urgency is that when you hear that word, when you hear cancer, you're like, okay, so what now, please? <laughs> what next? And is it now? Because I'm ready now. You know, like, let's go. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so Phil was able to publish, self-publish and put that book out. And it's amazing because who knows how many lives it's already saved. The number of lives, lives it's touched is, it's I, I don't even know, right? Because she, in her journey, dis, uh, discovered that I, I believe it's 58 Canadians a day. I'm not sure what the current number is, are diagnosed with lung cancer. So she did a campaign called Lunges for Lung Cancer. So at chemo, she would have like videos of herself doing the number of lunges for the number of Canadians that were diagnosed that day. And it, it was a movement that actually went around the whole world. People were sending in videos from all over the world doing lunges for lung cancer as an awareness campaign. And it was so great because it wasn't just awareness, it was action. Yeah. We'll, we'll put up uh, the links of... Uh, the topics that you're touching on oh, I mean, in awesome. your bio, um, yeah, thank you. so our listeners can find that. Um, so those are some of the benefits. Are, are there other benefits to self-publishing oh, rather absolutely. than traditional? If, yeah, 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 for sure. If you're a control freak and you have absolute, uh, <laughs> if you are singular, no, I mean this. Listen, I don't. Maybe that sounds disrespectful, but listen, let's just acknowledge that we've all done a little something. Um, and if you are a person for whom your vision is singular and you feel like uh, editors, publishers, they're not going to understand your very unique worldview. Uh, and you are passionate and you're, you, you're committed to the product. Go ahead and self-publish. You know what? You lose very little. Honestly, why not take the risk? What did Gretzky say? You miss how to present the shock you don't take, right? <laughs> I'm going to feel fine. I just made a, right? I just made a hockey reference tool. <laughs> He's going to be like, he doesn't know about hockey. Well, then I won't tell you the Stanley Cup party story that makes Joel angry. But... <laughs> I will leave hockey out of this. <laughs> um, so you must you must have a lot of ideas running through your head. I'm guessing I'm going to take a guess that writer's block isn't really an issue for you. Well, I think writer's block is the action. And I think, like, no, I, there's always, I've always got something to write about. Uh, my husband would tell you that... Um, falling asleep beside me is possibly the worst thing ever. Cause I'm like, <laughs> Hey, have you ever thought about like, what does parthenogenesis even mean? And he's like, it's <laughs> literally 10 30. Could you please not, you know, my yeah. brain, it doesn't stop. Uh, but it also means I've got tons of little notebooks all over the place. I have these fantastic little notebooks that I kind of have packed in my purse. Um, just like these little plain notebooks that stick a weird sticker on them for fun because I don't like boring things. And each one of them probably has like a couple of pages of ideas where then I'll like 
circle back. And you're like, where was that idea? Right. And every now and then I'll do a phone dump. So I'll look in my phone, I'll look in my notes section and all my weird things. And it's like, what did I mean about that with Santa? Like, what was my thought? Was that like a super deep thing? Or was it like a, oh my God, that would be so funny as a scene, right? So I'm getting better at my own personal shorthand so that I can understand my own notes. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I think writing is also a practice, which I definitely have a lot of room for improvement at uh, because of, you know, people like uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, she had Stephen King, same thing. The people who had these prolific careers uh, that were just epic at how much volume their output they got down to brass tacks every single day just sat down and wrote well if it was just crap if, if all they wrote in a day was this is crap this is crap they spent an entire day practicing writing which just you know muscle building yeah do you have a favorite genre that you like to write in you mentioned television uh oh yeah so this is, okay, so, children's yeah. Book. this is kind of fun yeah this is so um, one thing with my agent, the agency I'm with, uh, they have now expanded into television. And so at this point, I've actually written a couple of show Bibles, which is really fun. So a show Bible is essentially think of world building. So I start with a concept and then I build the whole world. I write a couple of episodes um, and then my agency uh, pitches, you know, potentially to external partners or uh, actually, we've now got a division which is film or book to television and film. And not, I'm not asking for the details in it, but how how do they get paid? Do they take from the profits, or yeah, do you no, have? Mm -mm. No. So if you have a book deal that, that let's just say for every hundred dollars they get fifteen, so fifteen percent basically of whatever you were offered, um, your agents and. Can I just tell you, I would be, I'm so happy to pay that 15%. I really am. Anyone who uh, thinks, oh, but the thing with publishing traditionally is you have to pay all this money. And I think, yes, but I went, I got a one book deal with, with Penguin, ended up meeting with my agents. And I was like, oh yeah, it's just, I mean, I had this other idea. They were like, well, tell us, which was the sequel to this book. Um, and, you know, they're able to turn around and pitch that to Penguin and to say, hey, well, actually, you know what, there's a book too, right? So I didn't have that ability, I didn't have that confidence or that industry know-how. Pay the money, pay the money every time. Pay the pros, Do only do what only you can do. You know, that level of executive function, work with that, really. The thing that makes you amazing, do that thing as much as you can. If you can, I suck at social media. My husband is so great. Listen, he got me in a website, got it all set up like a year ago. I am the absolute worst with following through with actually um, inserting content into this thing. Like, it, you know, I know that I suck at it. So luckily I have a teenager who I'm very much planning on paying to be like, hey, here's the deal. I'm terrible at this. You seem pretty cool. If you don't want to also, but you have a friend who wants to make the money, just tell me, and then I'm very happy to pay them. They can get it done, and then it's done, and I didn't have to do it. That's yeah. fantastic for me. Well, you're paying for their expertise. Absolutely. Pay for people's expertise. Oh, yeah. you want people to pay for yours. Yes. So be willing yeah. to pay for other people's. Of right? Course. Reciprocity is the key to success here. You be kind. If someone opens the door for you, and they don't need you to open one for them, you better open it for the person behind you. There is room at the table for literally everyone. This is not, uh, it's not high. You know, this is not a sum zero game. We can, we can make room for everyone. There is room for everyone to succeed and to have what they need and to have what they want. Yeah, that's great advice. And share, share the knowledge. Absolutely um, share. Yes. Um, f so for those interested in getting into writing as a career or a hobby, what is one piece of advice that you can, can give them? Invest in yourself and go check out a conference. Find wherever you live, I promise you there's got to be something either in your city or close to you. Um, find a conference that looks interesting to you. Go check it out. Go to the really boring, quotation marks, uh, forums, panels, all those kind of discussions. Go to the ones specifically with editors um, and publishers. Yes, 
it was amazing. Taking a class from Diana Gabaldon when there was me and like, what, nine other people in that room. It was remarkable. This is a lady who's like spawned all this incredible content and, and these storylines and these characters that people now love and, you know, embrace. Um, that was cool. And what was equally valuable to me was take, taking in every panel on uh, working with an editor, working with a illustrator, any of those things, all that technical know-how, that's the stuff that's going to matter so that when you pitch a book, so if I'm pitching a picture book, um, I now know that for my picture notes, because I'm not an illustrator, um, I'm going to just give a general idea of how I envision that page looking. And that's a guideline. It's a bit of like a, here's some suggestions for the illustrator and the editor. But the editor is very much a part of that story, which Again, you wouldn't know unless you're either talking to someone who's had the experience or you've gone to a panel. So take in all the industry things that you can and also just sit down and write, literally write, even if it sucks, even if you're like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. At the top of your page, write worst possible copy. Start it off with that. If that's your base level, do it. Whatever you've got to do to make yourself do the thing. If it means that on that first day, all you do is write out your grocery list, but you write it on that page, do it. The second day, you know what? Write out a poem that you like or uh, find a book that you love and find maybe a page that's really inspiring to you and copy in a paragraph. Um, literally make yourself physically do the thing. It will get you into that place that then when your idea is ready, when you're kind of ready to get out of your own way, it will flow. This book, again, I literally wrote my first draft in five hours, right? So the only way to make bread, I wrote it in five hours. Wow. That's and amazing five years of thinking about how pierogies and empanadas and gyoza and momo and samosas are the same thing for this format. And just with the pandemic bread was timely. And so bread was on my mind because of course we're all making a sourdough. Um, so bread was the right medium for this book to emerge, but it came from all of that thinking and research. Um, and yeah, research for me is eating. I get to eat cool stuff all the time it's amazing i get to know cool people and then i'm like hey have you ever tried lineppa oh it tastes so good with that thing you got over there i wish i could try some <laughs> <laughs> that's great um yeah. where can our listeners uh, find more about you do you have your my, website it, you mentioned yeah i mean no that's not that's not done in there yet <laughs> oh, we can my Instagram, which is cquintero underscore writer. So C-Q-U-I-N-T-E-R-O underscore writer. Um, and I do, you know, people can message me, um, all that kind of stuff. But uh, eventually I will have my website up and sooner rather than later, because my poor publicist is, is like going to be bald by the time this is done. <laughs> and she's got good hair, so that would be really neat of me. <laughs> well, Christina, you're a huge inspiration and I wish you the best of luck with, with all thank of the work you. you're doing. And thank you for coming on the podcast today. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you for tuning in to the Job Talk podcast. For more information, please visit us at thejobtalk.com. Our podcast music was created by our friend Mike Malone in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada.